Welcome to the Center of Light Radio with spiritual teacher, intuitive, musician, composer, and best-selling author of The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Welcome one, welcome all. Yes, Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Light Radio, Center of Divine Unfoldment and Reinforcement. And without fail, I announce yet again, strap in all ye spiritual astral knots as we launch for inner space. I am really keyed up about August 17th. Why, you may ask? Let me tell you. Swamji Viswayogi, a God-realized man, is going to be on Center of Light radio slash video. <laughs> uh, we're working out the details and all the particulars to do this as a live uh, video streaming kind of thingy. I had the blessed opportunity last year to meet Swamji and I don't know if, if any of you had the, ever had the opportunity to be in the presence of a divine, illumined individual. <laughs> there is something to be, I'm not going to say said, there's something to be felt. It's a remembering of your own essence, your own self, and in so doing, you feel the majesty, the power, the presence. The absolute awareness, there's such an amazing humility that takes place inside. By his reflection, you are able to touch the humility, which is, to me, a synonymous word for God. There's such a powerful presence in that. Make sure you write that down. I'm pretty sure the date is the 17th of August. Um, also, make sure you visit the Center of Light Radio website. You do that by going to www.centeroflightradio.com. Lots of cool stuff there. Really check it out. It's a really special looking site. I took my time with it. Filled with Hubble images um, of space. Uh, it's, it's all my backgrounds for all my pages. It's really cool to look at. But there's, yet there's powerful information there. My life's work, my creations, that which gives me joy. That's what, that what makes me zing and buzz. So my passion is into it. So I'm sure you would receive much from it as well. You can jump seat from there to go to Keith Anthony Blanchard to learn about my movie, Do What You Love, A Path in Passionate Living. The movie is about your life, empowering you with the tools that you need so you can go out into the world and be blissful and live your passion, which you know is the reason you were born. Something you cannot deny. You were here to be happy, joyful, blissful, peaceful. You do that by going to do what you love the movie.com. Check it out. It's a five dollar rent made by blue cast productions out of new york it was it was a trip it was a lot, a lot of fun we had no script and yet everything just came together with all the speakers all the guest uh stars i guess you can say check it out uh let's see uh, my notes here i kind of got to the microphone just a little late um let's see oh to call into the show uh live to ask a question or say something say hi of myself or my guest today, Mr. John Robinson, Dr. John Robinson, call 888-919-2355, 888-919-2355. Remember, if you are not at home and by your computer and you just got to hear your favorite show, hopefully it's the center of light here on Monday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, you go, go to the app store on your phone and download the, download the Inception Radio Network for free. Everything is right there at your fingertips. Chat room, listen, live link, news, podcast, much more. Always remember there are many ways to connect to Center of Light Radio as well as Inception Radio Network with all the fine programs they offer. And now it's time to get down to Center of Light Radio business. Today, my guest is Dr. John C. Robinson, and we will be, de will be dis I'm falling all over my tongue today. We will be discussing the new aging. I had a conversation with this gentleman last year or so, and boy, what a ride it was. Uh, he helped me feel good about dying. I'm not necessarily looking forward to it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, you lit a spark under my ass, and I, I somewhat really looking forward to it versus in my past, putting it off as long as I can. John C. Robinson, PhD and all these other credentials, D, M, I, N, whatever, all that stuff. Yes. As a clinical psychologist with a second doctrine in ministry, an ordained interfaith minister, the author of eight books, 
on the interface of psychology and spiritual spirituality, along with numerous articles, books, book chapters, and guest blogs. And last but not least, an aging boomer with grown children and a gaggle of grandchildren. <laughs> uh, we're setting the tone for this uh, voyage for sure. Yes, we are. <laughs> Great. His professional work specialized in midlife men's issues and the integration of psychotherapy and spirituality, the nature of firsthand mystical experience of psychology and spirituality of aging and is the archetypal revelations of myth and fairy tale a full-time writer now good for you bro his interest has turned to the psychological spiritual and mystical potential of the new aging and the list goes on but we're just going to get it out of him instead of reading what john has to say welcome to the center of light radio my friend Hey, my friend Keith, thank you so much for having me back. I love the way you introduced this, particularly the spirituality of, of life and how the whole purpose of life is to be transformed into something blissful and joyous. And that's what aging is potentially all about. The secrets of aging are about, uh, it's the most profound stage of human development. And the secrets are that this is your, your really final and biggest chance to get illumined, to be enlightened. And it's amazing how you use the word secret. Of aging. It's really no secret. It's just that those who are aware, as opposed to those who aren't, does make it a secret. Well, <laughs> well the thing is, Keith, it's either for, for most boomers, for most, most people my age, it's either too scary or too depressing or too far away to even want to talk about. It. So for them, it is scary because aging, you know, for all, our whole life experience has always been associated with, you know, decrepitude and dying. And so nobody wants to go there, especially boomers who think they can conquer it with, you know, with, with gels and exercise and, and, so, and surgeries and so forth. But the truth is, that if you just take the time to, to experience it, it will show you the way and what's inside of it is an entirely new revelation of life, what life's for. Something I've been wanting to ask you since I found you again to get you on this brand new platform for me, Inception Radio Network, which I absolutely love. I look forward to getting in this chair and in front of this microphone and interviewing phenomenal people who walk the talk like yourself, John C. Robinson. Question I've been wanting to ask you since I booked you a month ago, and it came to me very strongly yet again today, because when I asked you in the last interview, the question was, and your answer was just really, really <laughs> the one I was hoping for, but as we move closer to the interval of our passing to the other side, going back home, yeah. expand into an expanded state of consciousness, my question that I put to you, sir, was, we know that every day we're getting closer. We know that every week we're getting even closer and then every year. And so the intervals between our thoughts about our passing, I would think, get a little nearer. <laughs> and oh, in yes. so, but in so doing, is there an equally, an equal ratio, reciprocal, give and take, which is the amount of grace one feels about their death, the closer they get to their death. Yes, I, I think you're really on to something very important. You know, and, and at 69, I'm already beginning to feel it. And, and particularly when you've had a number of brushes with various diagnoses or surgeries that take you right to the edge or could take you to the edge, your consciousness begins to change. You, you begin to have a, I, I think the unconscious and the spiritual consciousness knows how to die. Your body knows how to die. It, it only really begins when the process is starting. So when you're 25 or 30, you know, you're light years away from understanding that. But when you're in your 70s, you know, and you relax into the process of aging, you begin to realize that it's like a, gosh, it's like one of those, um, one of those uh, people movers in an airport. And you just stand still and it moves you forward into a new state of consciousness where you say, I, you begin to have intuitions both of the ease of dying and, and of what's coming on the other side. It's almost like the veil gets, gets thinner. Yeah, at this time. people think that when you die, that it just happens, you're done and it's gone. But this no. is a process that happens every day that you are alive, so to speak. And of course, it starts to exponentiate towards you get to the, the climax or the zenith of the graduating point. You had said the body knows how to die. 
So my question to you is, you said a minute ago, at the age of 69, I am starting to feel it. What does that feel like? So us on not there at 69 yet can actually know when those subtler, finer, delicate energies are becoming present. So we can maybe have a head start from <laughs> glean something from your coming into your own. Sure. You know, there's a lot of subtle changes in this period that are what I've called enlightenment and slow motion. They won't affect you if you don't know about them. But if you pay attention, <laughs> if you pay attention, you begin to notice some things changing and you and you say, oh, my gosh, this is what the, the mystics and the gurus have been talking about. And it's happening to me. Let me give you some examples. There, there's a gradual fading of identity of, as if who you think you are or who you're supposed to be is really not very important. And actually, you begin to realize it doesn't exist at all. It's just a construction in your own mind, because right here and right now, there's only this, this consciousness in which we float, that if we get in touch with, begins to bring us incredible feelings of bliss and, and serenity. There's also, a, in this process of changing consciousness, a relief that we don't have to be anybody anymore. You don't have to put on the, the, uh, the, the costume of identity and be somebody important and pursue goals because that was all part of the middle years. The middle years are gone and it, it's a mixed blessing because you know you, early boomers want to like conquer aging with the same philosophy as the middle years, but it won't work. You need to let that whole thing go like one of the many skins you've let go before in your, in your life and allow your, trans, your consciousness to be transformed into a much wider more open, more spacious one. And then what happens is time becomes less important, clock, day planner, calendar, they, they don't really matter too much anymore. The whole high gear thing is gone, so we don't worry about doing things quickly. And, and increasingly, you drop into a kind of a silent, thoughtless consciousness, you know, like mm. you're looking out the window and you can kind of see the dust motes kind of floating in the sun. And for a moment, you're not there. You're just in this space beyond identity. And it's an intimation of, of the consciousness that's always here, but that you're beginning to dissolve into. Yeah, what a great way to say it. We dissolve into. So it's no longer about superficiality. It's about depth. It's about meaning. All yes. that frivolous stuff, all those bells and whistles begin to fall, fall away because now there's more presence uh, about depth. We can equate depth to spirit, that which is real, that which is meaningful. So again, what the closer someone gets to their time of passing, there's an equal amount of grace. When I said grace, I meant grace in the sense of grace that there's not this, oh my gosh, I'm getting closer to death kind of worry. Yeah. You know, you know, most people actually at the end die very peacefully. It's very easy. It's the struggle beforehand because we have all these m misunderstandings about what death is. And if we've gotten some hell and, and, and brimfire kind of teach early teachings of that, that death is going to lead to hell and damnation and judgment, then, of course, we're really scared. But in truth, that's not where it goes. That stuff just has to be burned away like karma so you can relax into the presence, the divine presence, and, and, and let it just come in, mix with you like two gases mixing, and then it's all right. You know, then there's a great deep, you know, relaxation breath, and then you're gone. I have a really good question or a good point, and I would like you to support the point or answer the question. Yeah. I'm channeling it. I'm literally, literally ch channeling it right now because I have it in the form of an idea concept. Because of people like you, who gives us, the listening audience, information about how it feels, knowing what you know, the research you have done, the practice that you have lived, um, giving us the information, for example, when you stated that, I, I feel it coming on at the age of 69. So if we can learn, be it through you, your books, or just self-awareness practice, that if we can start detecting those changes day by day, week by week, and start to see things starting to move and get lighter and subtle and our focus begins to shift on that which is no longer important and all these things, we could actually perfect our transition, say, I'm 51 and I decide I'm going to die at 85, 86 years old. But at the age of 51, I can perfect my transition process so that when the taxi cab does pull up, there's no hiccup, there's no jerk, there's no blackout, 
that it's truly an amalgamation, a crossfade, uh, a transition, and an effortless one with no sense of dizziness or fogginess or spin kind of idea. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, yeah, it does. And I think that as it's a very important practice, aging. Aging is a spiritual practice. And as you learn to live in a consciousness without thought, in, you know, in a, in a spacious consciousness where you're not caught up in thought or even believing in your own thoughts, because they're all forms of delusion at this stage. When you live in a consciousness <laughs> yeah. free of thought, then yes, thoughts may come up. And at the end, you might suddenly get an old fear that you thought, forgot about a long time ago. But the key is to let it come and let it go. And return, you know, you don't get get on it like a horse and ride off into the sense that you, you just let it pass through. And the next thing you know, you're back in that space again. And everything's okay. So does the letting go process get e easier as well, or is that something we should take upon ourselves now? Absolutely, of course. Uh, the, the, the practice of letting go, releasing that which is tangent, that which is not real, just even beliefs in all those yeah. things, the, the practice of letting go. But does it come again yet as part of that grace that when those thoughts might come in, being raised Catholic, a devil, yeah. hellfire, damnation, right. though that may come in in my senior years, is the same grace uh, administered through l being able to let it go a lot easier than previous times in life. Sure. A I mean, aging is all about letting go. Aging is all about a series of losses of, of who you think you are and of, and of health and of a certain kind of physical mobility and of dreams of the future and of all and of your importance in society. But all of those actually are useful because when you let them go, they open the space. They, they, they open much more space for you to, to be in the presence. And to be in the presence is to be in grace. So when you're, when you're here, free of thoughts, wide awake, um, in the moment, what happens is that consciousness is not yours. It's really the divine consciousness and it's really <laughs> yeah. God's body. And so as long as you're not intellectually separating yourself from all that by believing in yourself, as all that goes, it's all right. You're the whole thing. I think the divine human really is where we're, where we're heading. And, and it's particularly available as we age because there's this huge new developmental stage called aging, which is like 20 years longer than it ever used to be. In the human life cycle, it's a brand new developmental stage. And as all these ideas about ourselves and our attachments and our securities and all that stuff goes away, what's left is always consciousness. And consciousness is presence. I mean, it's very exciting when you realize that, wow, I may lose everything, but get, get it all, because this is it. You had mentioned that we're headed towards becoming the divine human. The word human in of itself is divine. The word mm -hmm. hue is another name for God. Uh, in Ekankar, the religion of uh, sound and light. Um, it yeah, makes hue, sense. Hue means divine, and yeah. man is of the earth. So we are naturally that. It's just that we, you know, forgot. We, exactly. We knew it as young children. We were grounded in the divinity of our own being. And then family, culture, school, peers all caught us up in this sense of pursuing an identity and this constant project of improving yourself and your resume. And that took over for decades. And, and then the final stage of life, what happens is that whole thing begins to d dissolve, disappear. Uh, you know, like, you know, like like fog in the sun, and then you realize that was all. You, you were chasing. You're running in circles. You were chasing your tail because what's here now is what you've always been looking for. You just tried to find it someplace else. You know, I've always said that when the first first word a child learns that represents separation is the word no. The reason young infants grab the things on the coffee table that your grandmother gave you that are made out of glass <laughs> <laughs> is because they know they can. They know it absolutely belongs to them. They Everything are not is. separate from those things that they are fondling with and playing nice with and wanting to, to grab it. Absolutely. Yeah, and then we say no. Thing. And that very first no cuts that dagger right through the experience and says, you are now you and this is now that. Yes. And it doesn't belong to you. Right. And share your things, and 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 I'm separate from you, and your brother's better than you are, and blah blah blah. And it's a it's a very sad construction of a self illusion. And then karma comes comes into play. Why did we incarnate in this particular uh, con continent, this particular state, this mm -hmm. particular city, into this particular family? Just to hear the word no. So there is so many variables. <sighs> yeah. But it's all about, it's like you say, it's all about waking up. And, waking and up. aging is the, is the great 
awakener because you know you know it's going to end you you can't keep putting it off and so if you're going to understand yourself now is the time and the more awake you become the more you realize that you you have been living a life of illusion because you have already been in the divine world. One of the things that happens in the mystical experience is that people not only feel a presence and feel surrounded and, and perfused with divinity, but the world itself becomes beautiful and bright and clear, almost like hy a hyper-real painting or photograph. So, and, and everything becomes luminous in this mystical experience. And so that you begin to realize that we didn't lose the garden it's already always been here we just left it on our own accord because we thought that that we had to become somebody important to get what we needed and as that somebody important melts away like a wax statue in the sun we we are back to that place we started as t.s Eliot said and it's spectacularly beautiful this we've always been in the garden we've always been sacred and this is what we need. To, this is why grandparents collude with grandchildren, whether knowing or unknowingly, because they realize that their grandchildren are still in the garden and they're trying to help them stay there longer before the parents suck them into the world of, you know, accomplishments and resumes and grades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's why I think my grand, my, one of my grandmothers in particular was such a soft place to fall. Yeah. Uh, there, there's nothing like a grandmother's bosom. Nothing. I mean, grandfather. Uh, Complete acceptance. Yeah, they're they're the <laughs> yeah. incarnation of the of the divine in that moment. Absolutely, you were talking about the world as you age; it becomes illumined. There's a light. There's a god fire. There's a beauty. There's an awe. Yes. Miss yes. about it. I'm wondering if that is preparing for our own illumination, getting us ready for the light. Yeah. For it, is, it is our illumination. The light is already shining. The light is shining in us, and that affects you know our capacity to see the light all around us. And it's so that that's why. See, if we if we're afraid of this thing, we say, "Oh my God, I must have had a bad day," or or you know, I'm on the wrong medication or something, and we dismiss it. That's why it's so important that everything you experience that you try to experience it fully, because in it is the, is the unfolding path of your transformation. John, why your fascination with aging and death? Did you have an experience? Have you worked? Do you have clients that have near-death experience? Have you done some studying? What brought you to this place of wanting to empower people about this beautiful process of life, ironically, death? Well, you know, it's interesting that you should ask. When I, w when I was 14, I, had, I underwent open-heart surgery for an atrial septal defect, a hole in the upper two chambers of the heart. And in that, in that surgery, I actually woke up. And I woke, and they didn't know it, but I did. I woke up, and I could feel the surgeon's hands inside my heart. I could feel the coldness. I, I, in, that, in that experience, you're paralyzed. You're, you've got blindfolds over your eyes. That Your body temperature's tuned way down. Your heart is stopped, and the heart-lung machine is plugged in. But I had an experience of death. I mean, this was like a living autopsy. I was aware of the state. I was aware of my chest open. It was a horrific experience. And it's taken me... Well, I, I repressed the whole thing for 40 years, and 40 years to the month, I had a, I was uh, cardioverted, you know, where they give a shock to your chest because of atrial fibrillation, and it all came back. And so the, the whole process for me was like a shamanic initiation, just delayed for 40 years, because at 14, I should have had it at that age. But the whole thing was so catastrophic that my psyche protected me by separating it off. But when it came back, I realized that that part of my calling here was to uh, get back in touch with this experience to realize that I am not who I think I am. I am not my body. I am not these expectations I have. And what a relief that is. And if we only didn't get so tangled up in our thoughts about ourselves, we would find out that we're already we're already not only divine, but we're already eternal. The, the forms will change, but the consciousness goes on forever. So I had a near, I had what you might call a near-death experience, not an out-of-body type, but a, the type that said, this is what it looks like, this is what it is, but, it's, but in fact, it isn't this, it's actually something much more grand. So you did have enough of a glimpse to capture a feeling, a uh, uh, more expanded awareness about it versus being like, quote, one of us on this side, just kind of guessing and assuming. <laughs> and yeah. You had a taste of it, yeah? 
Well, and, and I've also found that in, in my older years here, when somebody dies that I'm close to, it's as if a window opens through their dying and I can follow them for a period of time. When my when my mother died, you know, I was I really had a sense that I, I could continue communicating with her and find out what she was doing next and, and what what her struggle was after that and also with my father and, and a nephew that died. And it's been kind of wonderful following these people uh, to see how they've come to terms with what happened and how they've moved on with their lives life now in this next world. The window opens. The, 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 the capacity to, to experience the consciousness that embraces them all, it's all coexisting. And as the veil gets thinner, you say, oh, I can still talk to her. You know, she can still tell me what's going on. Nothing is what you think it is. You know, when my sister passed some years ago, mm -hmm. um, I got a phone call. I just moved to Memphis, Tennessee. I just moved. And two weeks later, I get a phone call from my dad telling me to come home. My sister's going to pass. I get there to the hospital bed and I grab her hands and she's unconscious. And John, she was pulling me out of my body or I was leaving oh, through her current as she was sure. disassociating. Uh -huh. And uh, I started to get what, at least what I thought from that moment was faint. At least that's what it felt, what it felt like. Got it. But I knew something much more grand and was going well, the on. The life force was beginning to be drawn out. Yes, there was. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I had to sit down against the hospital wall. My mom and dad said, "Keith, are you okay?" I said, "Yeah, I'm just fine." Of course, my mother's a worry wart, and so the last thing I want to do is tell her what it felt <laughs> like. Yeah. Um. So she can go on this tailspin. Oh my God, I'm losing two children. But all in years into the, to the future, I'm playing music in Memphis, Tennessee, one night at a club. Friday night. Long story short. A couple of weeks before this particular night in, in event, uh, a friend of mine was there. She was telling me about uh, she missed her deceased boyfriend and she wasn't a girlfriend. All these indirect ways of saying, I want to die. I want to die. I want to see. I want to be with him. I want to see yeah. his face and all this. Sure. So I told her to be careful. The next week, the same thing happened. Hey, Keith, and she's drunk and my boyfriend and I miss him and I wish it was me and not him. Da, 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 da. And I told her the same thing. You might want to be careful. That night, her, her ex boyfriend. Uh, at that time, uh, they had some troubles in a relationship, came into the club, uh, scrounged two dollars in his change to get in to pay the admission, looked around the room, saw her, walked up to her, pushed her police officer boyfriend out the way and shot her in the back dead with the oh, caliber. Gosh. And so uh, I'm about to go on stage and I hear a snap. And if you don't turn my PA system on in my amplifier in a certain order, there's an electrical pass through and there's a snap. And so exactly when I flipped that switch, there was that sound. So I attributed to that. And then I hear it again, and people are rushing towards the stage, stage saying, oh, my God, and I'm saying, oh, my God, that's a gun. And so I'm in denial while I'm ducking because I'm saying this can't be happening. So after I felt confident that things were okay, 45 seconds, a minute later, um, I, I went around the room, and I saw her laying on the floor, dying. Wow. And there were police officers who were fans of the band, uh, paramedics, and I'm running in, in to her. And a couple of cops say, uh, where do you think you're going? She's one of the main people there, paramedics, said, let him go. She, wants, she would want to talk to him. <clears throat> wow. This, that is very profound and, and yeah. tragic. And so as I walk up running wow. to her, I, 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 lean, I get on the floor with her, and I put her hand in, one, in my hand, and I put her head in my other, and I began to talk to her. And all the fear I had when that shot went off, all the fear and anxiety and anger, I was mad, even before I knew it was her, um, that took place. When I touched her magically, it stopped. Yeah, it, wow. It became something very, very beautiful. Wow. I felt honored. I felt privileged. Yes. I felt blessed that her and God, or higher consciousness divine, trusted me enough to be the person who whispers sweet somethings in her ear as she was passing. Yeah. Yeah. And that experience for me, as you said, was not about death. It was about an opening. So through her dying, I got to touch that place within myself. Through That's that beautiful. What a beautiful experience. And what a wonderful teaching it was. Because we always <laughs> yeah. re recoil from what looks like a horrible thing, but yet when we're right, when we're right with it and touch it, it's not what we thought it was. 
People who have out-of-body experiences when they're, you know, in a, in a car accident or something, they may be floating above their body looking down, and they're, and they're trying to communicate to the paramedics and say, hey, hey, that's okay, I feel great, let me go. You know, I've never felt so good. You know, you know I just wish that everyone in that room fine. could have felt what I felt, because while I was having this amazing wash of bliss, um, and her death was beautiful to me, they were still in the experience of the fear the yeah. anger, the separation, the pa the pain, the death, the loss, the grief, the dying, all those energies. Yeah. Yeah. J John, we are at the bottom of the hour. Would you give out your contact, sir, to our listening audience on Center of Light Radio and let them know how they can find more of you, your books, and all this phenomenal work you're doing? Hey, thank you so much. Yes, you can find me at www john robinson r o b i n s o n dot org o r g uh, there you'll find all my books and my web my website you can you're welcome to i've got a you know an email link there you're welcome to email me i love to respond to people's requests and questions and so forth so come visit me i can tell that you do i can tell that you know you may have busy days and some emails might back up but i can see you as the guy that gets in there and makes a sandwich. <laughs> you get in there and you talk to people. And that's, yeah. that's why you and I have such a great kick yeah. when we do this show. Uh, listening audience, make sure that you dial 888-919-2355. 888-919-2355. Come on the air with John and myself. Come say hi. Uh, Center of Light Radio, Monday nights, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You know, John, I've had experiences, soul experiences, when I've been to the other side, not per se astral travel, though it might have been astral travel in higher forms. This was more like a causal experience. I was touching, I can't, I, there's no word. In fact, you're not supposed to use a word, but no way I can describe it with words. Uh, there was like s subtler and subtler layers. And I was actually brought, was brought, came upon the Godhead. And the experience that was about to happen was the only thing separating myself, my conscious awareness from it, which I absolutely knew without a doubt beyond myself and this layer was the Godhead. And it dawned on me that what this layer was, was a thought in my mind. It wasn't a wall. It wasn't permission. <laughs> it was a belief in my head. Okay, Keith, you have now come upon the center of creation. So in that, declaration i've automatically had separated myself from it and i was truly given a, a glimpse and basically like a, a curtain yeah. curtain yeah. on the stage being lifted yeah. up real quick and dropped down again in a matter of a, a second i mean it happened that fast but in that second i was able to get a blast of light information knowledge mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. i knew <laughs> another part of the separation thought I knew that somewhere down there, a gazillion miles down, on a bed was the body, the identity. Keith Blanchard, all that is important to him, dang it. Right. Uh, and, and all my arrogance and all my beliefs, all my um, subconscious yes. Catholic beliefs in what I thought is right and wrong, holy and blasphemous, good and bad, love and light, and all this cool stuff. And I realized I was not ready to, <laughs> no pun intended, die. Uh -huh. and. Uh -huh. They showed me that glimpse, and they were, tr I can't explain it. If you've seen the second movie, The Matrix, yeah, when they're in the tunnel, and they all just doing this primal, tribal, kind of passionate, juicy, stomping, and dancing, and celebratory kind of thing. I have no other words to describe it, but it was like that. And so, obviously, I chose not to walk into it, because the, the final part of the separated thought was that if I walk into there, I'm not going to come back. Uh-huh. Well, you had a mystical experience that had near-death qualities to it. And, 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 you know, and in fact, when you, when I used to, I've done a lot of workshops with people on mysticism, and when I ask people, when I, when I explain to people what, what a mystical experience is, that, that kind of experience, or an experience of oneness or, or um, surrounded by a presence or a brightening of the light or a sense of unity, almost everybody will raise their hands and say, and they can find 
one. We've all had them because the divine is leaking into our experience all the time. Seekers like you and me try harder, and so oftentimes we have bigger experiences like that, but not necessarily. So a lot of people have profound mystical experience who are not religious and not trying, and suddenly they're walking across a field and it hits them and they are forever changed. The thing is that what you're experiencing in that in that profound a mystical unity with the other is that you're experiencing yourself. That's the self with the capital S. That's the Godhead that we always project outside ourself and then try to find. But, but the irony is, of course, that we can't find it someplace else until we go within and find it, at, like you say, at the bottom, at the center of our own creation, and there it is. And we still have a tendency, you know, I'm spiritually illumined, you're spiritually illumined, we're all spiritually illumined, right? And we know all the truths, and we know all the principles, we know all the techniques, we know exactly where it is to find it. We still keep looking outside. Well, Rumi, Rumi <laughs> the, wonder, the wonderful Sufi poet said, none of us have gone far, <laughs> which is probably an, an apt description. <laughs> And, you know, and then there's the other side of that coin. In fact, it's the whole coin. It's, there's not an inside. There's not an outside. All there is is really an inside. Yeah, that, all those things are boundaries that are artificial. We, we create those to, to divide the world up in the, into the 10,000 things, and then we struggle with them. And, and in and consciousness, I, they all melt away. Yeah, and I told that long story because of something you said, that when we cross over, it's, it's not about the thoughts. And those thoughts, as I was describing in my experience, no matter, and I even described a bunch of them, they were beliefs, they were right and wrongs, good and bads, holy blasphemous. These are all just thoughts. They're just fanciful ideas. Exactly. Exactly. And they have no meaning whatsoever. Exactly. The thought only becomes real is when it passes through your mind like a cloud if you grab it. And that's when you anchor and congeal it to the earth energy because you're physical. Right. You you in, in tenu, uh, in, intending, you're willing, you're calling it forth. But so it's really about letting go. Yeah, we create our own earth. suffering. We get create our own suffering with these belief systems that we attach to and then try to fix ourselves with an erroneous belief in the first place. And we do this for years. The, you know, the, the spiritual path I and mean, the stages of faith, the stages of spirituality always get to a place where. Um, you realize that it's not in books, and it's not in teachers, and it's not in complicated philosophies or theologies. It's in the moment. It's in the silence. It's in here. So there's and really just, no spiritual practice, and, I'm, and this is a question to you, other than truly there are different practices and techniques you can use, but in the end, it's really all like letting go because all the thoughts that we have that are higher in nature, that's one thing. But it's all the other earthly stuff that we need to dissipate, let go of in order to ascend a little more, the transition to be smoother. From the chat room, Profundity has a phenomenal question, and I've always thought this myself. He asked the question, John, are yeah. we not always, quote, there, but just sure. not consciously aware of it? Absolutely. While, while Absolutely. here, don't we and occupy both the spirit realm and the physical realm concurrently? Yes. And the, the key is to stop thinking, heighten awareness, come into the presence, experience the presence, and then see where you really are. All that stuff washes away, and you realize you're in the garden. Yeah, because we can't be here and not there because, you know, we manifest our physical bodies from the realm of um, the unified field, from the quantum birth field. We, we pro literally project ourselves into three dimensional figures of matter, but if we were not there still, there would be no extension of light for ever that connection, that for that expression to ever happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, unity means unity. It, it doesn't mean, you know, duality. <laughs> right, right. As above, so below. Yeah, exactly. So this is, I mean, the, sadly, pantheism got a really negative uh, rap it, you know, when science said, oh, it doesn't make any sense, and religion said the world has fallen and, we, you know, it's all sinful and, and blah, blah, blah. And the truth is that it's all God. It's only God exists. And then we, with our minds, make all these separations. And when we b b dissolve the separations and as we age and we realize, oh, my gosh, I'm part of the oneness. How glorious is this? And there's no place to go. There's nothing to figure out. There's nothing to, to solve. 
I've been in, in it all the time. Then there's a peacefulness about going. Is where are you going to go? <laughs> You're I, I'm, I'm sure now at about this moment in this radio show, you are probably feeling that buzz. <laughs> yes, we're cooking here. I, I feel the energy. I feel my energy elevate. I, I can only assume, and I, I, I wouldn't say I've ex, I have experienced it to a degree when I mentioned the Godhead experience, but also in some of my nightly excursions. But in the transition of death, I can only imagine, and I've had many levels of feeling when I was in, in India with Sai Baba being blasted wide open, but the remembering that must manifest and anchor itself like a lightning rod when you cross over that first bang of reality. Oh, sure must be just uh, something probably your physical body couldn't even stand. Uh-huh, yeah, and that life review must be, must be incredible. And we've all done it many times, you know, and I think actually as you get older and closer to the end, you begin to remember more of that. It, again, it leaks through from the other side, and you say, you know, I, I've done this tr pan, tr uh, transition before. I've been through this passage. Again, I know that's, that's the grace. Me. That's yeah. the grace. That's the grace. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Mm. John, are you excited about uh, your passing? <laughs> you, you know, I am. You know, I've had very some medical crises, like like a while, you know, a couple of weeks ago. They they thought I had congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease, and and I and I turns out it was probably a false positive. We don't know for sure, but the thing was, I I, I was a uh, of a of a mixed mind about it. The part of me was, oh my gosh, I'm not ready. But part of me also said, this is no big deal, you know. I'm I'm I am infinitely happy that that I am in this moment and whatever happens does not really matter. This is going to mm. happen. Everybody's going to go along. They'll be fine. And so I think that when the, as we age, we have more and more of these kind of epiphanies like, oh, OK, so I could die. That's all right. I was going to ask you a question and you answered it absolutely poetically in what you said. My question was going to be my first person first call out a statement, which is I didn't want to get personal, but. I was going to ask you in a situation like you just described that you might have had a medical crisis re uh, recently that was could have happened, that what the thoughts would, would be in your mind. Would it be, ah, let me go to the doctor? Of course, we want to live as long as we can because that playground is going to be there forever. But yet, I'm okay because I'm infinitely happy. And in that letting go, does that create a doorway for more longevity versus rushing to the doctor which yet is still an intention for longevity do you do you follow my, my no my no no say, yeah I'm, I'm not quite with you say it again when this crisis was upon you yet again in your recent past did you find yourself moving quote but yet metaphorically and literally into this window of like you said i'm blissful i live forever blissful and happy i'm infinitely happy you said yes so did you find yourself not rushing to the doctor so quick to create longevity a little more life but yet in your relaxed letting go about it all probably eased your beingness your system which may have given you more life than freaking out and running to the doctor yes actually i think i think the shock of it allowed me to let it go I mean, I was like, whoa, and, and then there was a kind of a letting go of the whole thing because I realized it was just a drama that was happening in my mind that was going to, you know, play out in whatever way it did. But I was not that drama. And, and um, there, there was an okayness to it. I think that's what happens. The more of these things that happen as we age that would have been catastrophic at 30 or 40 or 50, I think, and, and later you say, this is part of the journey home. And, oh, okay, so I, I, that'll happen or won't happen, but I'm no longer so attached to staying alive as I used to be or I need to be. And as a result of that, I'm more comfortable with the flow, you know, with just being in the river of life until it goes wherever it goes. Whether I live longer or not seems to be less important than, than um, being okay with the whole thing. Feeling that the, this this amount this vast love wells up inside of me from the from the depths of my being and this joy happens and then you know after that how can you be upset about anything? <laughs> yeah, wow, dude, wow, 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 and I can feel that when you express yourself, I I can feel your sincerity. Where are you coming from? That this is really truly your truth. Yeah. 
I'm in. Appreciate that. Appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> wow, phenomenal. So what is, tell us about this new book you got coming up, my friend. So, so I wrote this novel. I, so I've written these seven books, and they're all, I think, really quite accessible to, to the average reader. And I think you'll, everybody will enjoy all of them. But I wanted to summarize them all in a story. So I wrote a, a, a novel about a psychologist who takes on a new client. And the client is a very, very depressed uh, young man. And he comes in reporting that he has this recurring dream of Jesus coming out of a dark black lake coming toward him, taking his hand and leading him back to the lake. And as soon as his feet reach the water, he wakes up in terror from the, from the nightmare. But then what happens is the next meeting or so with the same client, the client is, begins to be absorbed in a profound mystical experience, just like we've been talking about, where a, a profound sense of presence is around him. He feels released from his, his suffering. He feels full of joy. The lo- world is light. The world is beautiful. And that consciousness begins to bother the psychologist because he thinks, well, what is this, psychosis? Is this schizophrenia? Is this brain damage? What could be going on? But worse, or better, the psychologist's own consciousness begins to change. It begins to notice the same as like contagious. And so that sends him on this long journey to try to figure out, first through his colleagues and then through a vision quest and then through a number of life adventures that he pursues, such as self-seen prophecies, trying to figure out what do I make out of this? And in the process, he, his own life is transformed. So it's John, as I already reported, I, didn't, I really didn't get a lot, uh, most of what you were transmitting because your microphone was going into like this digital pixelation. Can you give me a synopsis of that book that you're coming out with again shortly, sir? Sure. I'll put it like this. When a middle-aged psychologist is working with a client, Describing bizarre mystical experiences, his own world changes radically, taking him on a breathtaking journey through divine consciousness in the revolutionary spirituality of aging. Wow. Wow. I've this, and I, I, a bunch of really well known gerontologists who are very spiritually oriented and, and were like president of the, of the uh, Saging International, uh, people who've been worked for uh, AARP and so forth. And they, and they all say it's very. They've all given me endorsements, and they're all saying it, it really describes the mystical experience of aging well. So if you've got older friends, parents, or yourself that are interested in a great story that pulls it all together, that's, this, it's coming out in October. I was going to ask you that. So it's coming out in October. Uh, I would be absolutely honored to read this book and uh, put my name to it if it's something I, su- <laughs> I support you. I would uh, love you to read it. I would love to read it, and I would like to put my name on there or whatever it takes for you to support you and your phenomenal work because my dialogues twice now, you have moved me, sir. You have enlightened me not only with information. I'm able to feel what it feels like to be you in your infinite happiness, in your grace that you are feeling by the questions that we have been ping-ponging back and forth. I can truly feel your comfort, your ease, and your okayness with it. So you have brought something really, really magical in my life at this age, preparing me for the greatest transition of life, which is yeah. death. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Keith. I really and I appreciate you, too. You really are there as well. And so this is, these are great conversations. John, we are coming towards slowly but surely the top of the hour. Would you give out your contact information where they could find you? You work in this phenomenal new book that I'm just jonesing to read. <laughs> okay. Once again, it's www.johnrobinson.org. O-R-G. And from there, you can find all my books and, and as well as this, this last one and a way to contact me. John, what is God to you? You know, God is this. You know, if you talk to a, the- if you talk, if you answer that question with the left hemisphere, and you you can come up with very complex theologies. If you ask a mystic or someone who's had mystical experiences, you'll get very simple answers, and they're, and the answers are like this: this is God, this now here, what is? This is it. No, there's nothing else. There's nothing else. <laughs> Um, let me know when this thing's going to birth. Um, though you said in October when it gets closer to the crunch, let me know. I would love to get you back on the show to okay. help create a push. Let's that would do be, it. I, w- I would be honored. Uh, we're slowly but surely getting to that moment, John. And gosh, these conversations are so fun. Uh, is there anything you want to dialogue with me about before we sign off and I give you a final thought? 
Uh, I, I can't think of it. I mean, this is just wonderful. I'm enjoy, I enjoy our time together. Um, I think we're touching all the deep stuff. I might just say that, you know, a- aging is, is a mystical experience. It really, it's a religious experience. And I just invite everybody to not be afraid of it and to open their hearts to it and, and to let it show you that it's not frightening to die and that aging is actually one of the greatest gifts that we get. John, if you ever do any traveling and you happen to hit anywhere towards the Mid-South, um, I'm going to invite myself. <laughs> I would love to do a co-presentation event with you. Yeah, hey, that'd be fun. That would be, look out, you and I together. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> we can make some noise. <laughs> yeah, we should talk to old people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. John, I, I really absolutely appreciate you, sir. Thank you for being here on Center of Light Radio. Keep us posted what you're doing. And that door to the other side <laughs> always <laughs> swings open to you, my friend. Will do, my friend. Till then. Be well. Okay. Wow, what a ride that was for me. I really enjoy this cat. Uh, He does something to me. He gets me thinking. He gets me out of my box. He helps me to expand into a place that I know nothing about, which is really, really cool. Um, Because the newness, the virginness of it all is always just fresh exciting, invigorating. I I love talking with this guy. John C. Robinson, what a a fantastic show. Every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, my name is Keith Anthony Blanchard, and I will be sitting in this chair, and you will be sitting in your chairs or driving in your car, whatever it is you're doing. Make sure you call 888-919-2355. Become a part of this family. Let us hear that voice. It helps us to key in on your personality and who you are. You are welcome here. Remember, when you lay down at night and you have nothing else to do, why not do something? Breathe passionately. Taste God as it moves in and out of your body. (sighs) Be grateful for your life and the gift of it. And so doing, you will realize that you are the real you lies just behind that breath. Just behind that breath. Always remember to ease into bliss and spread the light. I bid you all a good evening.